Thank you all for coming um, and giving up this sunny summer afternoon mm -hmm. um, to, to have a chat about uh, Karen's life and love of the law. <laughs> um, how it's going to work is I'm going to talk, we're going to have a conversation for about 40 minutes, at the end of which you'll have the opportunity to ask uh, Karen some questions. At the end of that, we can have another drink and you can ask her more questions over a drink. Does that sound all right? Excellent. So, Karen, do you want to talk us about talk to us about first of all about how you got into the law? Lots of people say this, but in my case, it's true. It really was by accident, or good luck, probably better described. I left school when I at, at sixteen with very few qualifications. I had my daughter when I was still in my teens, and decided I wanted to go back into education. So I went into what was described then as a return to study course. So it was for people who'd left school early with no or few qualifications who wanted to get back into the educational environment. So it taught you research skills, essay writing skills and so on. And I did that for a year uh, and I enjoyed it very much. And they said, you know, there is, I, they, would you be interested in going to, into higher education? I said, yes, but I haven't got any A-levels said well we'll look around and see if we can find anything that might be available and I applied for some things just trying it on like history which I really wanted to do and they said you know universities said quite rightly go away you haven't got any qualifications which was a rational response um, and then one of the uh, uh, course tutors said there is a law degree here where they're offering 12 places they're reserving 12 places for people who haven't got formal qualifications and it will be an assessment process, interview and so on. Is that something you think you might be interested in? I thought, well, I have no idea. Ne you know, I, won't, I had met a lawyer, but I won't tell you in what circumstances, because it won't put me in a particularly good light. Um, <laughs> but apart from that, I didn't know anything about it, but I went along and um, I found out about it, decided to apply and I, I got on and did my law degree. And there we are, and I very much enjoyed it. It suited me very much so it was what incredible like about it intellectually stimulating but the off the opportunity to, to you know to bring about practical change in a person's life so not mere intellectual endeavor although i think that's important i'm not uh, uh, suggesting that that's not an important thing in itself but the opportunity to make change for, for individuals in particular and as you get more senior of course the opportunity to make change in so far as the development of the law is concerned but certainly at every level, that real hands-on possibility of making change. Um, so, And yet you went to the bar where you're perhaps less likely to meet normal people than <laughs> becoming a solicitor. Yes, it's true, but you, I mean, it depends how you practice. I do engage very closely with my clients, by yeah. and large. I mean, there are exceptions. Um, uh, but, you know, if you're representing, for example, the mother of a woman who's been murdered in front of the mother and the grandchildren by an abusive ex-partner it's not a case that you can do in a hands-off way yeah. it's something you need you know you need to have a close relationship with the person but why involved. did you decide to go to the bar rather than because i like speaking okay <laughs> and i thought the idea of sitting in an office for 30 years even engaging with clients just wouldn't so the advocacy the bit. advocacy which i really love i really do love it i like arguing and i've always enjoyed arguing and there is a really the law being a barrister is a structured environment in which you can argue yeah um so so yes and is that what me. you like most about being at the bar i think probably the advocacy is the thing i most enjoy um i wouldn't want to be a barrister that did only paperwork and some do um i i enjoy the advocacy i like being in court i like the exchange i like the you know the, the verbal toing and throwing um, and the possibility of expressing oneself And what maybe in that way. don't you like as much about it? About being a barrister? Uh, oh, well, I don't like being shouted at judges, which regrettably still happens. Uh, I, I can tell you a recent case. Mm -hmm. I won't identify the judge, or at least not, not until we're outside and we're over a drink. Um, I went into court recently 
uh, and I stood up and there were those are sort of formalities that you engage in when you stand up in front of court you say you know my lord I appear for the appellant my learned friend Mr Bloggs because they normally missed her Mr Bloggs appears for the defendant this is an appeal against the decision of blah de blah and I got to about I appear for the appellant and he appears for the defendant he said I'm not interested in any of that what I want to know is why you're here I thought sorry <laughs> that's a very you know, esoteric <laughs> question I don't know <laughs> I didn't study philosophy my lord um, uh, so uh, and he was aggravated by some uh, something completely unimportant and which he was reassured about in due course but there can be some rudeness by judges which I find infuriating particularly as I get more senior but leaving that aside which we just have to learn to tolerate um, I think long hours and and stress I mean it is very stressful standing up in court um, and making arguments in front of an audience um, and the higher up you go the more judges there are and often the larger the audience um, so that can be very stressful and people often students and uh, junior practitioners often say do you still get nervous and the answer is yes it's what gets me up at four o'clock in the morning to make sure that my all submissions are finessed and just as I want them to be um, I'm very good at not showing nerves in fact I'm exceptionally good at not showing anxiety but I certainly do still get nervous and that so that stress and the hard work and so on. So the lifestyle. The lifestyle. It is long hours. It is difficult to predict. If you're if you're an ad, if you're a barrister who practices in court as opposed to uh, written advocacy only, you know you will you can be presented with three lever arch files the night before. The government says, "Oh, sorry, we've not complied with our disclosure obligations, but here you are," um, and so you inevitably having to stay up to deal with that and so on. So that's that's the that's the bad bit. But for me, the other bits make up for that. And your, and your practices are very much focused on equality, non-discrimination and human rights. How did you find your way into that particular aspect? Of um, I think I was al always drawn to discrimination, or, or equality in particular, um, possibly in part borne out by my own experiences, in part. I mean, I don't, don't you know, not say entirely, but the fact is I had seen how positive measures to achieve equal outcomes had worked in my own case. I mean, I would not, I, w I would have been um, somebody on a very modest wage doing a job I didn't enjoy for 30 years or 40 years, however many years, because I would have had to have worked. Um, and so the opportunity to gain access to uh, a profession which otherwise I would have not had access to, you know, made me very personally conscious mm -hmm. of um, the need to take steps to positively secure equality but I also when I first started out before I went uh, I did pupillage um, and then when I qualified I went to a law centre and worked at a law centre for two years in northwest London Brent Law Centre and we did a lot of equality work there I mean in a sense all law centre work is about equality because you're yeah. always representing people who are socially disadvantaged and so one way or another it's all about equality law though it's not so described uh, but we did in fact do quite a lot of race cases and that's really where I started to do race discrimination cases and a, certainly a large part of my practice has been race discrimination in particular um, and I enjoyed it and so it developed from there really. And then you went back from Brent Law Centre? Into, back into chambers, into, chambers. In, into private practice. In fact I went into the chambers I did my pupillage at. I did pupillage and they said thank you very much Karen you've passed and you're now a tenant and then on day two, I said, thanks very much. I'm now resigning. I'm going to a law centre. So <laughs> but they were, kind enough, they were kind enough to let me back anyway. And then you went to Matrix. I went to Matrix, uh, yes, about when I was about 15 years ago or something like that. So fif about 15 years ago. No, well, I, about 15 years ago, I went. I don't know how old. So about, I'm now about 25 years ago. So I was about 10 years ago, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and with the quality cases, I mean, where, where's the work? How have you seen that work change over that period of time? Well, when I started out, one of the reasons I did so many race discrimination cases was because we had the Commission for Racial Equality, yeah. which preceded the um, Equality and Human Rights Commission, which took over the commissions that had previously existed that were focused on race, 
disability and gender. Um, and the Commission for Racial Equality in particular had a litigation focus, yeah. you, you remember. I mean, that was their thing. We will litigate, we will litigate, we will litigate. We will make these people do the right thing by getting them into court, getting the publicity, getting um, uh, damages awards against them, and some of them were very significant. Um, so that's, that's where it developed. Unfortunately, we're not seeing that now. Yeah. We're seeing much less institutional support, as, yeah. you, as you know. Um, so it tends to be legal aid if you can get it, but you often can't. Sometimes privately funded. Um, sometimes Equality and Human Rights Commission. Uh, but often, I mean, you know, some of it's pro bono, um, or the NGOs will take up uh, uh, points rather than um, individual cases and run, run with it in that way. But there has been a shift, I think. There's th the Commission doesn't have the same focus as in particular, in particular, in particular, the Commission uh, that the Commission for Racial Equality I was, had. I, before I went came to justice, I was doing quality law at an organisation called Interrights and I was asked by the CRE to go in and do a consultancy for them because they adopted case selection criteria and I think they went from having 230 cases they were funding a year, so your kind of cases, and they adopted case selection criteria and the following year they funded three cases mm. and they wanted me to assess their case selection criteria which are basically so rigorous that no case yeah. would be able to satisfy yeah. it yeah. And, and they decided that they would only, f and we tried to explain to them that actually normal cases are the strategic cases. It's yeah. like how you argue them, how you support them, they're the ones that change the law. It's yeah. not like there are special magic bullet cases that you can easily identify at first instance. Yeah. But yeah, I think you're right, the funding problem is, is massive now. It is, it's incredibly difficult. It's incredibly difficult. And the, ca the cases, you, I mean, you've, you've argued equality cases across grounds of discrimination. So yeah. you've done LGBT cases, disability, I mean, you've done the whole yeah. gamut. Um, and you've done across housing, all kinds of different areas. I mean, to what extent have you had, are you sort of comfortable with all of those things, I guess? I mean, how do you balance those arguments? How do you? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult because one of the things about being, doing equality law is equality law doesn't exist in a vacuum. Mm. Inequality happens because you can't get on a bus, uh, in which case it, it will uh, engage transport law. Yeah. or you can't park your caravan, um, you're a traveller and you can't park your caravan in a field, so it will engage planning law and land use. Um, so it does mean that you have to, you know, I become a mini expert on yeah. something. So for a week, I'm an absolute brilliant planning lawyer. Ask me the <laughs> following week a planning question and I wouldn't know the answer. Yeah. But, um, so, so yes, that, but that's the Article that 14 sort of understanding that you bring to that particular context. Yes, yeah, precisely. And, um, and, and often the planning lawyers, the housing lawyers, the education lawyers, as the case may be, miss the equality points. And I often read cases and think, why wasn't that one as an equality case? Yeah. That would have been so much easier. Um, but it, it, I mean, from my point of view, it also makes it very stimulating because everything is new. You know, it's, of course, things do come up over and over again. Quite a lot occurs in employment. Uh, in pub certain public law challenges are sometimes very similar. But there is a lot of... But it is one of the more vexing kind of areas of human rights law. I mean, equality and, and how you find comparators and indirect mm -hmm. discrimination. I mean, it's, it was when I first started doing it in 2002, it, I found it intellectually yeah. much more challenging than doing plain... I'd previously done lots of torture cases, which are pretty simple. You yeah. just, the difficult Somebody's stuff is, you down and... Yeah, you I mean, up, the yeah. difficult stuff is around the client client care and all of that sort yeah. of stuff but but the actual law is really simple you're not allowed to talk to people yeah. and um <laughs> and it's pretty easy to prove yeah. whereas with the colleagues often extremely difficult to prove yeah. with david goliath kind of evidence problems and you've still got all of that pastoral care stuff mm. i mean is that intellectual part of it is again part of the intellectual challenge yeah yeah that I mean, I think a lot of it is, um, first of all, they're very difficult to prove. Mm. But, I mean, there's different kinds sure. of inequality cases, as you know. I mean, if it's a, a direct discrimination case, which sounds very easy, you know, they treated me less favourably because I'm a woman. Sounds very easy, but actually it's very difficult to prove because very, very rarely, it does happen because some people are extraordinarily stupid, <laughs> but very rarely will somebody stand up and say, yes, I treated her less favourably because I'm a woman it will normally be because she was irritating or because she didn't work quite as hard as that person or whatever. 
um, and actually proving that's very difficult. Um, and then there are other cases which in some ways are counterintuitive if you don't know about equality law. So indirect discrimination, you know, I've treated everybody the same. There can be no complaint, I've treated everybody the same. But indirect discrimination will occur if that equal treatment disadvantages one group or another. It's not equal treatment to say everybody's got to work five days a week, nine to five, if that's going to disadvantage women with children who still bear, obviously, the main responsibility for caring. So, but that's sort of counterintuitive if you're not an equality lawyer. And you get asked questions like that, even in the senior courts. How could that be discrimination? They treated everybody the same way. Mm. You think, God. Or they didn't intend it. And, or they didn't intend yeah. it. I mean, you know, you think, God, bloody 50 years of anti-discrimination legislation, and you're still being asked. Yeah. Well, and are you finding public authorities and government and discriminators to be copping on a bit and being, therefore being a bit cleverer in the way they're... I mean, you mentioned the super dumb people who, yeah. who, who just <laughs> will say, you know, but she's a woman, she's yeah. obviously not clever. She got pregnant, uh, oh, I'll do. Um, <laughs> but, but, I mean, but it strikes me that over time people cop on that there are ways around this sort of stuff and so you start using different language and you start yeah. using different processes and... Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, I mean, it's, as I say, people... Uh, in, Certainly public bodies have become more sophisticated. They still make huge mistakes. Mm. Um, but generally speaking, things like indirect discrimination, which may be counterintuitive to a judge, a public authority will understand, and they will gather together everything they possibly can to establish justification. So, um, because indirect discrimination can, can be justified. So uh, they have become much more sophisticated right. and much more savvy about that sort of thing and much more savvy about finding a, a trail which will uh, rebut any suggestion of direct discrimination. Um, but things still do happen. Um, so, I mean, there's still plenty of litigation, as you know. Yeah. Um, so, but yes, it's, uh, there's, there's certainly a greater awareness, which I suppose is a positive thing if, sure. if they're aware and not doing it. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, we, we obviously now stand on the precipice of Brexit, potentially. Um, how important have you found the EU law to be in equality protection? Critical, absolutely critical. I mean, it's driven forward almost all of it. Not all of it. Um, the Race Relations Act stands alone. Um, that was an entirely UK-driven set of equality laws. There was a very po particular political context for those laws, which uh, uh, caused their introduction at the particular time they were introduced. Uh, but our gender equality laws are entirely um, attributable to EU law. And even the Equal Pay Act, everybody says the Equal Pay Act was caused by the, um, uh, the women workers yeah. at, they immediately escapes me, it's the I don't know how that happened, it'll come back to me, yep. the factory workers, the women factory workers, how can I forget that? Um, uh, and, and actually that did provide a political context, they went on strike for equal pay, which was almost unheard of in the late 60s. Um, and that was certainly a political imperative, and the Equal Pay Act was enacted in 1970, said to be in response to that, but actually in large, if not exclusive part, it was because the EEC, as it then was, made as a condition of membership uh, compliance with what was then Article 119, which was the uh, equal pay guarantee in the treaty. So it was a condition precedent to entering the EEC. And so that was very much, I mean, I don't say that the um, uh, uh, women campaigning for equal pay had nothing to do with it. It made the political journey easier, but certainly we can thank Europe, I think, for actually causing it to be, it wasn't brought into force, as I say, so after we went into the EC or as part of the process. Um, and thereafter, all the gender equality laws, equal treatment laws, pregnancy and maternity laws, and, and certainly things like um, sexual orientation laws, all driven by Europe. I said the exception was the Race Relations Act, the other one was the Disability Discrimination Act, yeah. which preceded uh, European legislation. But otherwise, um, I think we can, we can say that pretty much all of it's come from there. And I think if we left, nothing would give 
Farage and Boris greater pleasure than to rip them up largely. Yep, that's the big danger. So I think we need I'll to be, be very worried about that. Apart from having the prospect of Boris leading the country and Farage being in the cabinet, but leaving that aside, <laughs> images, and yeah. Trump as president of the US, but it starts uh, to sound like a sitcom. <laughs> um, I mean, once the Secretary of State for Justice and Lord Chancellor has got us out of the European Union, the next thing he's going to do is try to get rid of the Human Rights Act. Yeah. How do you feel about the Human Rights Act and the British Bill of Rights? Um, I I don't feel. I think that I, I think there are two ways of approaching that. I feel anxious about the repeal of the Human Rights Act and the introduction of a Bill of Rights under this government and in the context that it's yeah. been proposed. And that's because it is, it's, it's a device to remove ourselves from Europe uh, on the pretext that they are some horrible body that doesn't understand our domestic values and so on. Uh, and because actually they want to reduce the level of protection, whatever they say, they want to reduce the level of protection. Um, so that causes me anxiety. As a matter of principle, if this were an abstract argument outside the present political context, I would say I don't think there is anything particularly bad about having some uh, uh, domestic bill of rights, some domestic set of human rights and civil liberties um, set down in some domestic measure, um, whether that's in the form of a, 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 we won't, I mean, if it were a written constitution, I think many of us would feel that was a very good thing. Um, but that's not going to happen. No. Um, so I don't feel there's anything in principle wrong with having a domestic Bill of Rights that reflects our traditions, reflects our values, which are, of course, reflected in the convention since we pretty much wrote it. Um, I mean, something that they seem, Boris uh, yeah. et al. seem to forget, we pretty much wrote the convention. The UK um, had an extraordinarily large part in that. Um, so I don't have an objection in principle, but I'm concerned that the politics are such that really what they're looking for is a fewer driving rights, down of standards. Yeah. Fewer rights, more difficult to enforce, less precise, and so on. I mean, they, there's a lot of scepticism about judges, the current uh, human rights sceptics. You sit as a High Court deputy. Mm -hmm. what, what's that experience brought to your practice and your understanding of, of how you practice as a barrister? I think it's really helpful, actually. I mean, much. Um, I was quite surprised how much of a difference it made to the way I saw practice, the way I saw myself. Um, I suddenly became acutely aware of things that might seem almost immaterial in, pract in practice. You know, the way one makes all submissions, um, overstating things unnecessarily, not having documents in order. I know this sounds pathetic, but you know, how to run, a, how to persuade a judge, you know, is not to throw your papers all over the place and start shouting or whatever. Um, is that what you were doing before you became a <laughs> deputy? <laughs> I didn't need to, <laughs> to be a deputy to get that lesson, but you get my drift. You do, you do suddenly see what works, what's impressive, um, and what's not. And I, I suspect, you know, that that, I'm sure, if not consciously, then subconsciously will have had some influence about the way I, you know, the way I think it's right to play a case. So you put yourself more in the judge's shoes, perhaps, don't you? Yeah, or I sort of recognise that actually, that's a good point. Say it once, don't bang on about it. He knows it's a good point. Normally he. I keep getting told off for calling judges he, but regrettably, that's the reality. Yeah, it's just easier. <laughs> um, easier and correct. Um, uh, one of the cases you've recently been involved in was Rutherford, um, and which is a bedroom tax case. Maybe, I mean, it's had a lot of press coverage. Maybe you could talk a little about that and some of the challenges in, in bringing the experience of a very vulnerable person mm. to a, a group of pretty privileged mm. men <laughs> who were judging. I mean, how you translate that experience, have them understand. That's very difficult. I mean, I, can I, before I come to that, I'll come mm. to another example. I did a case last year on... Um, forgotten the name of it already this is what happens when you practice you do a case like I say you're an expert for 10 minutes and then you forget but it was to do with um, the introduction of a 
an amendment to the council tax scheme, which meant that local authorities could require every person to pay a proportion of council tax, whatever their circumstances. They weren't compelled to do so, but as a revenue raising device, they could, um, they could impose a, a tax. Uh, in this particular case, my client was very seriously disabled and had been for some years. He was on state benefits, he lived entirely on state benefits, and he was required to pay, I think it was £2 a week towards his council tax. The way that played out in practice, as he told me during the case, and as I eventually told the judge, was that um, it would cost him £104 a year, therefore, in council tax, um, which may not seem... Two pounds a week, yeah. Four, eight pounds. Yeah, which may not seem a lot if you're working. For him, it was the cost of the special shoes he needed annually, and he had to pay for privately because he had particular feet impairments. And when I went into court and was arguing this two pounds a week, the judge said to me, "All right, Ms. Monaghan, but you know it's two pounds a week." And I said to him, "Well, two pounds a week to you and me, my lord, is a third of a glass of wine, or a quarter of a glass of wine if we're treating ourselves." To my client, it's a pair of shoes every year that allows him to walk in comfort. And, you know, those arguments can... I mean, I sometimes feel you have to absolutely confront the judge's privilege because, yeah. you know, two pounds a week to a judge is absolutely bugger all. And that is capable of being translated into the way he sees the case. Rutherford, a different case. In fact, I didn't do Rutherford, I did A. There were oh, two right. cases, A and Rutherford. Ruther Rutherford was to... Both were to do with bedroom tax. Um, the bedroom tax, as you probably know, uh, was introduced with the effect that those um, in receipt of housing benefit were deemed entitled to only a certain number of bedrooms. And so they would receive housing benefit determined on the basis of the number of bedrooms they were deemed to acquire. And if they had more bedrooms than that, they didn't get housing benefit for it. And so inevitably they would have to leave or be evicted. Rutherford was a case of a child who wasn't able to share a bedroom with his brother because he was very severely disabled. But the bedroom tax rules provided that if two boys, two children, were deemed to be able to share a room. So the third bedroom they had, um, that the siblings had one each, um, was deemed to be over was said to cause over occupation because it wasn't required uh, and he was challenging the rules which did not permit another bedroom in circumstances where siblings couldn't share. My client was more diff uh, significantly different. She was a woman who had been the victim of very extreme domestic violence. He would tried to kill her, he'd killed somebody else before uh, and he'd raped her and various things and she was in secure accommodation, accommodation that had been made especially secure by the police and various authorities because of the risk to her life. So she had spotlights, she had a post box outside so there wasn't a mailbox that something could be put through. She had a panic room, she had alarms in each room, and various things. And she'd been allocated a three-bedroomed house 25 years before because the council didn't have any two-bedroomed houses. So they'd given her a three-bedroomed house, she only needed a two-bedroom, and they now were... Um, reducing her housing benefit on the grounds that she didn't need the third bedroom. She never needed it, but was allocated it because they didn't have a two-bedroom. Um, and we were contending that that would put her life at risk. Um, and it was also discriminatory on gender grounds because those that were likely to need specialist housing of, those sort, of that sort were overwhelmingly likely to be women. Overwhelmingly. Um, there were a couple of men in such schemes, but, you know, a couple. Um, so, uh, and that again is talking to, in fact, we had one, we had the one lady judge on the court, but the rest were men. And, you know, engaging in discussions about gender, gendered forms of violence, patriarchy, how it works out, why it's gender discrimination and not just ordinary unfair treatment is, you know, you sort of want to throw bits of paper at them and say, I'm, let's talk to me, I'm listening, you know. <laughs> like my grandson you know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so it presents challenges having to sort of overcome uh, what what you might you know what you might perceive as ignorance you know perhaps not perhaps they're fully engaged but sometimes you feel there's a bit of a hurdle to overcome there's certainly a, a certain 
and we have problems with social mobility as much as we have mm. with anything else. Like our, our judges tend to come from a particular, have a particular life experience and particular mm, precisely. class and educational background perhaps. Yeah. That gives them a, a certain prism through which they can yeah. evaluate some things perhaps a bit better than they can evaluate others. Well I agree and I think that there, you know, one worries about whether or not they are aware of that. Mm. I mean there is an assumption I think among judges I don't think just think particularly men judges, I think just judges, that somehow becoming a judge turns you into some objective being without any material life experience. And so you bring, you know, objective eyes and an objective mind uninfluenced by anything to a particular intellectual question that arises for determination. And actually we know that's not really life. We do bring our life experiences when we're making judgments, inevitably. I mean, we'll get to, to your report on judicial diversity in a second, but I mean, most of our judges obviously come from the bar. What's been your experience as a woman at the bar? I mean, well, have, you, have you experienced discrimination or difficulty or? I think there's no doubt that I've experienced discrimination. Um, I think assumptions are made about women barristers, uh, uh, suitabil suitability for certain types of work, um, their, you know, uh, uh, their robustness, um, and I think as well their value. So I'm quite sure that at times I've been paid less than colleagues doing comparable work. Um, but I haven't experienced the most, the, the most uh, uh, disadvantaged or disadvantageous, well, the disadvantageous forms of discrimination at the bar that women experience, because I haven't had a child while I've been at the bar. Had my, one of the only things one can say positively about teenage pregnancy is it means you don't have maternity leave when you're starting out your career. Um, <laughs> but I think, <laughs> I think maternity leave and having babies at the bar is mm. one of the most, um, one of the things that disadvantages women so much because there are so few accommodations made. Judges don't make accommodations, court listing officers don't make accommodations, often chambers don't. Yeah. Um, and so I think I've been fortunate that I haven't experienced that, which I think is one of the, the main causes of the yeah. sort of cause of the attrition rates that we see uh, so far as women barristers are concerned. And, and your report, um, I mean, you've been a passion, passionate proponent of more inclusive judiciary for, rel for a long time. It's not the first time you've said anything about this. Um, but you did this report last year with Geoffrey Bindman um, that, amongst other things, suggests a quota system, uh, which sent off some alarm bells um, around the profession in the Royal Courts of Justice building. Do you want to talk to us about them and how you would imagine them working? Yeah, I mean, I think the... Uh, it, it very much, I mean, how a quota will work will very much depend upon a discussion and thinking about what would work in a particular judicial context. And they work very differently elsewhere. I mean, quotas aren't uncommon, first of all. They're, they're very common. Um, uh, taking an example, a, a close example, because, or a topical example, because we've just had the nominees for the European Court, UK spot in the European Court of Human Rights announced, the European Court of Human Rights operates a quota system. That is, that uh, states are required to put three names forward um, uh, for the post of uh, judge representing their own, or sorry, for their own country, their own country's judge. Three names. Parliamentary Assembly decides ultimately who will be elected, who will hold that post. But one of those three names has to be a woman. So it's a quota system. One out of three must be a woman. It doesn't mean that woman will get elected ultimately, but what it does is ensure there's a woman on the slate. And that by itself has had a phenomenal effect. I mean, it's transformed the court because suddenly states have had to find a woman, which they didn't bother to do before. Um, so that's one example. Other examples that operate in other European countries in senior courts Every third person has to be a woman until you reach a certain number. And if there's a, an imbalance the other way, every third person has to be a man. And the advantage of that sort of a scheme is that if you have the absolutely marvellous candidate who's a man, and let's face it, we're told they all are, but anyway, let's say you have 
the person with the brain the size of a planet, um, a lot, um, among your applicants, you can choose the person who has the brain of the size of the planet, even if they're a man, so long as the next person is a woman. So it allows for some flexibility. That's, that's one way of doing it. I mean, there are a range of examples, and they, need to, they would inevitably need to be worked through. And I think importantly as well, because it's sometimes been raised in discussions about this, we recognised when we wrote the report that quotas by themselves aren't likely to be effective yeah. because you need, to have a, you need to have a structure, an environment in which women will want to work and can work. Um, so, but, but nevertheless, certainly we felt, I feel very strongly, that with one woman in the Supreme Court, the same woman, the only woman we've ever had, and the whole of the court being replicated since, 12 appointments since hers, all men, all white men, I think, frankly, it's um, indefensible. indefensible. Roberts, yeah. Anthony's Two, exactly. We've got mo Robert. more men called Jonathan, more men called Robert, Robert and Anthony. Yeah, and Anthony than we have women. I mean, you know, that's pretty scandalous, isn't it? Um, and I mean, we have now. We've got nine. The whole of the English and the whole English con component of the Supreme Court will change over between now and April 2020. Mm -hmm. Are things going to be any different, do you think? I think they will be different because apart from anything else, it's excruciatingly embarrassing. It is. Um, you know, these senior judges have to go around, poor old Newberger. So I say, I know, I, I really want, I do, I promise, I promise, I really want women. You know, uh, so they're fed up with having to argue about it. And I think it's just becoming so excruciatingly embarrassing um, that they will have to find women. So it will change. But I think it will ch change unless we have a quota system. I think it will change very, very slowly. Um, you know, we'll have Brenda Hale. Um, she's due to retire two years, is it? 2020. Oh, she's 2020. She's that long. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I've she's a 70. So she's a 75er. Yeah. Okay. Um, they've changed the age um, uh, threshold. Or um, okay. Well, sh she'll stay. They'll they'll appoint another woman, I reckon, while Brenda Hale's still on the court. So we'll have two. But I don't think we should take it for granted that there will be another one before Brenda retires. So, you know, we could end up in a situation where we have one again. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, for example, with Linda Dobbs. Linda Dobbs, is, as you know, was the first black High Court judge, black woman, as it happens. Um, and we didn't have another black appointee until Rabinda Singh. Mm. Um, and that was after she left. So we've only ever had one black High Court judge at a time. Um, and I have two. Oh, we've got now because we've Bobby. got Bobby now. Bobby. Yeah, Bobby. So we've got so two. So we have 108 High Court judges, 43 Court of Appeal judges, 12 Supreme Court judges and two people who aren't white. That's right, Bobby. Um, so we've got two people who aren't white. Uh, and that, when was Linda appointed? 15 years 15 ago? Something like that ago? Yeah. Something, so in 15 years, we've increased by one, one non-white uh, judge. Uh, so I don't think we should assume that things will... I mean, the problem is everybody always says. By the head, by themselves. Sorry, my computer's locked me out. Um, everyone always says, "Oh yes, it's a problem." Because justice, as as uh, Felicity mentioned, justice is about to appoint a working party to look at this. And so I spend a lot of time talking, as you spent all the time talking to people about this, and they say, "Oh well, it will change. It will change," because it's embarrassing. Mm. Which is fine, but that only deals with the embarrassing problem. Mm. It doesn't deal with the actual structural uh, problem. Structural problem yeah. and the fact that a more diverse judiciary, but some the size being just not embarrassing, mm. will actually bring something to the way things are adjudicated. And I think that that's kind of the piece that's slightly missing at the moment. Yeah. Um my password's incorrect. I'm not sure how that happens. Yeah, I mean I agree. It's uh it's you know, it, if if we're going to see real okay, if we're gonna see a real shift Either we have quotas, or and or, preferably together, we have we we get a collective understanding among the senior judiciary and the politicians that diversity is good for itself, yeah. in and of itself, not just because of the opportunities it provides to those who get appointed as judges, uh, but also because it brings a range of experiences to those difficult legal questions um, that have to be answered, in particular, by the senior courts. 
have one more question for you before we open it to the floor, and that is, what do you think? I mean, what makes a good lawyer? What makes a good barrister? And what makes a good equality barrister? Uh, oh, that's a really difficult question. Um, you can just describe yourself. If you no. like. <laughs> um, I think empathy. Actually, I think empathy is underrated. I think empathy is very important. Um, I think you need to be able to, I'm not saying I do it all the time, I'm sure I don't do it all the time, but I do think you need to at least try and understand what it is your client's experiencing and what it is that's most likely to ameliorate that pain or hurt or disadvantage or whatever, um, and try and put your yourself in that position to a degree, because sometimes things can seem insignificant until you put them in a context where with everything else in that person's life it becomes a very real problem. Um, so I would say, you know, the normal things, you know, intellectual ability, hard work, etc. Um, some degree of self-awareness which is generally lacking in barristers. In fact, it's almost a qualification to be a barrister. <laughs> Do you lack self-awareness? Yes, they are. You're in. The, you're on. Um, you uh, uh, but I, I think empathy as well. And and what advice, if any? I mean, I'm asked this sort of stuff all the time, and I hate it. Um, would you give to young people, not necessarily young people in the audience, who are thinking about a career in the bar or a career at law? I would encourage you to do it. I mean, be, be aware of the difficulties. Um, there are difficulties. It's expensive. It's highly competitive now. I came in at a time when it was very much easier. Um, only one in four, four people who um, graduate from bar school, as I understand it, get traineeship now. Um, so be aware. But if you want to do it and you've decided to do it, notwithstanding um, that background, work hard at it, try, and more than anything, do something you enjoy. Um, because you're likely to be better at it. You're likely to uh, enjoy your job more, inevitably. Um, and you won't get to 82 and think, why did I do that for 60 years? Um, so do something you enjoy. Be aware, be realistic of the environment that we're in. Um, but give it a go if you're really committed to it, making sure you do what you like. Great, thank you. Questions from the audience? Just want to put your hand up and say your name. Yes. Mm -hmm. I sit on um, and I do sit on a board, I sit on a couple of boards, and one of them is the uh, it's actually a women's centre, so that's great that's for women, but a very different personalities. And things really get done. Another board I, I sit on is a legal is a legal uh, board and I got on that board because I said that they're Asian. I think it's I think it's graceful that um you've only got one woman on the board. Please please join us with one woman and one woman. And that's great, and I get along every month. And they do do that. Well, I think you just become a monster. I, I agree. Have. I have. I mean, I think I'm probably regarded as a, you know, a monster. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, you, I mean, the reality is we're forced into that position of having to bang on. You know, you can almost see people's eyebrows, ra you know, raised when I say, I'd just like to say something about women or the absence of ethnic minority. 
yes, Karen, yes, yes, oh, no, no, you're quite right, you know. Um, so it is infuriating, but we have to do it. Um, and we do just have to keep banging on. Um, uh, and, you know, c writing, complaining. I write and complain about things even when I've done well out of them. Well, I got appointed as a Deputy High Court judge under a scheme that I thought was wholly un lacked any transparency, lacked any proper sensible method of uh, 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 assessing a person's competence. I got it and I still complained. I wrote, I said, I would have complained if I didn't get it. I feel duty bound to complain mm. even though I have because this system was entirely inappropriate in the 21st century appointment of judges. And I'm sure, I, I'm sure they were enormously irritated. They probably thought, we've given the bloody woman a job and she's still moaning at us. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think the problem is if you don't say anything, nobody else will. Yeah. And that's, the, that's why you end up do, having to do that. I was, um, I was invited to speak at a conference a couple of years ago on Judicial Review by a big legal publisher and it was it was on JR so it's an area with lots of women practitioners and a week before the conference I was sent the agenda and of the 23 speakers that day there were three women I was one of them and Angela Patrick from our office was another and I wrote to the organizer and said I've just seen the agenda I note that there are only three out of 23 women speaking and none of whom were giving keynotes we were all on panels Angela was mm -hmm. chairing something and I was on a panel the other one was on a panel um, and so I hope that if anybody pulls out, you'll consider replacing them with a woman. And got this response from Thompson Reuters uh, saying, um, saying uh, we're not in the slightest bit concerned about gender parity or gender um, balance on panels. Our only concern is to have people on our, who speak at our conferences who other people will pay to hear yeah. speak and people don't want to pay to hear women speak. No, they didn't say They that. did. At which stage I, I hope said, you didn't go. No, at which stage I said, yeah, fuck, fuck you. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, and, their, and their response obviously was, well, now we're down to two women. Yeah. Like, you know, you've just made it worse for us. Mm. But, I, you know, if that's going to be the attitude, you know, and, and again, I felt I didn't, I wasn't very pleased. Mm. And I ended up writing to the rest of the people on my panel saying, this is why I'm not going mm. to be speaking. And Angela stood in for me. She decided that it was all a bit too radical and I let her take a conscious decision. But, but I just didn't want to have anything no, to do with it. No. But again, if you, don't, if you don't say that, none of the other men on my panel were going to say anything. No, and I think it also the other thing is that we must remember is the responsibility of the men as well. Yeah. Um, to, to say it's not just always the responsibility. And although it may feel very isolating to take that position, and you know, I've been there, I am there, um, you are doing it, I'm doing it, Andrea's doing it, there are others doing it, so you're not actually alone. There is a community of women and a community of men who are doing it, um, and we just have to keep doing it. Um, uh, and it's you know, not the responsibility of the women or the black barristers or the disabled barristers to be arguing about ethnicity, dis race discrimination, gender discrimination, disability discrimination. It's all our responsibility. Mm. It's our responsibility to be concerned about all forms of um, discrimination. Uh, and so just carry on and recognise that you're, on, you're, you're right. <laughs> Another that question. works for me. <laughs> <laughs> Another question or comment? Yes, sir. Um, my name's Judah. Uh, Hi, Judah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the course, as you mentioned, is very expensive. Mm -hmm. You said that our injury issue is often through the law. Mm -hmm. um, and that there's a lack of ethnic and female diversity there. Um, how do you think the educational institutes and potentially the institutes should Change their tact to allow, I guess, from a grassroots level, that diversity. Mm. I mean, I think there was well. There's there's two ways of doing it. There's one at the top and one at the bottom. At the top, there's no reason why we need to have barristers as Supreme Court judges. I mean, you know, being a barrister makes you no less suited to that job than an academic. Um, so we could introduce more diversity uh, uh, th through that route laterally. Um, that's not to say that academia doesn't have its problems and so on, but that would be one way of dealing with it at the top. At the bottom, I think it's less about the ends of court, really. I mean, they can give money, they can give scholarships, but they've got a li limited fund. I think it's more about the introduction of student fees and the withdrawal of student grants. 
Um, when I qualified, I didn't pay any fees at all. There weren't such things as fees if you were a home student. Um, and I got a full grant and I got a bit more because I had a child. And then I, my bar school fees were paid as well. Um, and that was all and under I got Thatcher? a grant. That was under Thatcher. I got a grant. <laughs> and then uh, I got a scholarship from the Inns of Court as well. I mean, I, we were, I was loaded. I went, on, I went to Jamaica. <laughs> I got my scholarship from the Inns of Court and went to Jamaica for six weeks with my friend <laughs> and our kids. I'm sure, you know, thank God the Daily Mail didn't get hard with that. Um, but um, uh, so, uh, so it was a very different environment. And, you know, it really is a very serious political question. And, um, as you may have read recently, I don't know if this perhaps triggered the question, but uh, the, though there has been some social mobility in the legal profession, so we have seen over the past 30 years or so increasing numbers of people from uh, non-private schools entering the profession, there's now been a regression. Mm. So the proportion of people coming into the profession, profession from private schools has increased. So we're going the other way. And I'm quite sure that's to do with student fees, the absence of grants, and the risks. I was able to take a risk about getting a pupillage because you know, I, I, I didn't owe any money to anybody. Um, and I was a lot richer than being on social security, which I had been before I went to you. It was an encourage, it was an incentive to go into higher education because I had more money than I did when I wasn't. Um, so I think that's a real problem and I think that's a political question. Um, it's and it's a really, really regrettable, you know, really, really regrettable that it was a Labour government that introduced student fees. Well, it's one of the reasons that at, at Justice we have paid internships because we yeah. had a really high number of our interns went on getting security pupillage and training contract. But they were just the people who could afford to come work for us for free for yeah. a period of time. And the organisation I'd worked for previously, all of our, all of our internships were international and paid for. Mm -hmm. So our interns now, one of whom is in the room, um, are London living wage. Um, so, so we can open up those opportunities. So we had 300 people apply for our summer internships. My apologies to those of you who didn't get them, but we had like, such great yeah. people apply because yeah. it becomes actually available Accessible. To, yeah. to ordinary people. Yeah. Um, and, and no d drip in quality. Yeah, like absolutely. Um, other question? Yes. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's quite a good f campaigns actually, a few campaigns that are really um, doing a really good job of showing how the Human Rights Act has applied to what might be described as ordinary people. I mean, I hate that expression since we're all ordinary um, in our own way. Um, but you know, to the you know the the Daily Mail stories about the Human Rights Act are all terrorists, members of ISIS. Well, I mean, you know, the, uh, it's, the, but actually the reality is it's about um, people whose children have died in a care home and they should have been being looked after and they weren't. And the um, need to have a public, you know, the need to have an open public hearing on what happened through an inquest, which the Human Rights Act has guaranteed, which we didn't have before, or, um, you know, the rights to live with your, the, the right to have your family join you in circumstances why you might be separated in cir circumstances relating to poverty, for example. Uh, the need to ensure that your children are near enough to you that you can visit them. I mean, all sorts of very basic human needs. Um, and uh, there are campaigns that really illustrate that. There was one that was set up by Dow two women at Martha, actually, yeah. Martha Spurrier and some other women at Doughty Street. I think it's called, I forgot what it's called. Act Sorry? for the Act. Act for the yeah. Act. Act for the Act. Um, and they have, you know, provided lots of illustrations of the sorts of cases that all of us would be able to relate to, because we've always, all of us have got friends or mums or dads or children or siblings or, and perhaps all of them. Um, and so we can all see, well, if that happened to my child or my mum or and rights my info, friend. And Rights Info, which is run by Adam Wagner, who yeah, does the, he does the UK same. Human yeah. Rights blog. It's called rightsinfo.net, yeah. I think. Um, but that's also got, got kind yeah. of the positive stories because the research shows that you know the Daily Mail and the Sun use, are using ten stories. You know, mm. There's the, the cat, emo the yeah. cat, cat.
case. Which was all Abu untrue Qatar, anyway. I mean, all like prisoners yeah. voting. I mean, it's the same 10 cases that just get rehashed to show that the Human Rights Act is for, you know, terrorists and pedophiles, which is as opposed to normal people, that it's, it's our rights. Why do they do that? Because they don't want the Human Rights Act. Because they don't think it's, um, they're not content with having a scheme which allows people to challenge state authority um, on the grounds that are contained in the Act. I mean, it is an interesting question. I would like to have Gove or one of them here and say, well, let's just go through. We've got the right to life. You don't want the right to life? You, you want it, you, you're, you're, happy with, um, you're happy with a police officer kick, kicking the you know, kicking your child's head in the right to life, that okay? No, I love the right to life. Okay, prohibition on torture. What about that? Prohibition on torture? Got a problem with that? You know, okay, f no, no, okay with prohibition on torture. You know, and so you, slavery, okay, was prohibition on slavery? Is that okay with that? Yeah, yeah okay. So we're up, to, we're up to Article 4 already, you know? Um, f what's 5? Oh, yeah, custody <laughs> detention. Detention without, tr detention without um, legal sanction, you know, without law. No, no, that can't be right. Okay, fine. Fair trial? You okay with that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you go through them and they're all pretty basic stuff. Um, so I think it's, they don't, want, they don't want people to easily access those rights. But in addition, it's part of a broader political anti-European picture. So there are, there are different things going on at different levels. Because actually the reality is if you sat them down and said, well, what about slavery? You okay with slavery? They'd say, no, no, no of course not torture you yeah, know of course we're not. so and they are pretty fundamental rights um, so there are lots of other things going on and Gove hates Cameron and Cameron hates Boris and so they're all arguing about things that you know because they've got into trouble at the Bullington Club yeah well they're all, they're all proxies for other discussions you know hi Mark I haven't seen that Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, how likely do you think it is that the list of protected characteristics could be expanded? Uh, and what would you like to see added as the first one? To well, weight already, actually, in some contexts, is disability. a protected characteristic within the context of disability. The Court of Justice have said in certain contexts, um, weight is, is a, a excess weight, obesity will constitute a disability. What would I like? Social, social class? socioeconomic disadvantage. That would be my one run. That would be in. Um, and in fact, in the Equality Act, Section 1, which was never brought into force but was enacted, did introduce a duty on certain public authorities, not all public authorities, but certain public authorities, to have the need, to have regard to the need to uh, reduce socioeconomic disadvantage when exercising their functions. So there was a slight move towards introducing socioeconomic disadvantage as a quasi-protected characteristic, but it was never brought into force. It hasn't actually been repealed, but it wasn't brought into force. But that's what I would call for. And it's never going to happen. <laughs> Certainly not under this government. <laughs> so hand at the back. I can't see who it's attached to. Hi. I'm not from Linklater, I'm from Justice. Okay. Don't know anything about Linklater. No, sure, they're very good. No, but matrix. So inclusion in what context? Diversity. Diversity. Yeah. Uh, in practice, uh, in terms of employment, recruitment, there's actually very little that can be done because positive discrimination, which I would be in favour of, is prohibited. Um, so, but the practical te steps we take in relation to recruitment are wide advertising, providing training if there's a request for it, so that people can be considered having training. In, mu in other words, they don't have to start there, they can apply there and we will train them to there. Um, internal promotions so that we can get people in at entry level and then move them up. Um, we also have our work experience placements directed at particular target groups, so state schools and so on. But I can tell you, 
we have not been good, particularly in relation to ethnicity. Uh, the picture's changed pretty sharply over the past two years, but for about the first 10 years, we had virtually no black and Asian staff at all. I think we had one, um, and I think for some time, none. Um, and there was a major fight in chambers, um, monumental fight, and amazingly, when people fight, which is why I say you have to stand up and fight, suddenly, by, you know, we suddenly have now two black receptionists, a black fees clerk, a black librarian, legal of. Now, I'm not saying that's just chance, but I'm just saying it, it's not, a, and I'm not suggesting that there was discrimination beforehand. Let me put it, this is my place of work, so, you know. <laughs> uh, but I think what it does is make people think more carefully about the decisions they're making. Um, I mean, it could be coincidence. It just be co it could just be we had lots more black applicants all of a sudden after there was a big hoo-ha. Um, but in London, it was totally unacceptable because, as I don't know if you're a Londoner, right, well, you'll know that there are more non-white Londoners now than white Londoners. Um, so to have a workplace where there was such disproportionality was just extraordinary. Um, Yeah. 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 No. I mean, there is. I mean, the the the, the fees move move further up, but the receptionists are. I mean, they're not low. I mean, they're you know they're not right at the bottom. To put it, I don't want to say right at the bottom because you know it doesn't quite work in that way. But um, but yes. But it's true. We d we haven't got a black chief executive. We've got a woman chief executive. Um, but clerking historically, which is the main job, uh, the main staff job in um, barristers' chambers, so those are the people who get your work, who make sure you're in the diary, make sure you take a case on, they have his, uh, historically been white men, white working class men, and it's been a very clubbish environment. And although things are changing and have changed, there is still that way in. You know, you've done, you've been a clerk for 10 years, you're able to go to a uh, respond to a job advert and say I've been a clerk for 10 years. Well that puts you in a, um, a favourable position. Um, so yes, there are, I mean there, we do make efforts like work experience, like uh, we also operate the tie break procedure so if you've got two, though you're not allowed to positively discriminate, if you've got two candidates who are of equal merit, you've assessed them equally and one's from an underrepresented group, you can appoint that person. So we use that um, but I think often it's shouting and screaming and throwing your toys out of the pram. Yeah. I have, yes. Well, we do have disabled barristers. I mean, it depends how you define If you define disability in terms of the law, we do have disabled. I'm a disabled barrister. I've got epilepsy, so I'm certainly disabled. I also have asthma. Um, uh, so we do have disabled barristers in chambers. But in terms of visible and prominent disabilities, those that impair the ability to actually pra or access the courts and access um, barristerial work, um, it is, it, it, we don't, I mean, we have one woman who's really found it difficult to stay. Um, and it is a very, it's a very unforgiving environment for disabled barristers. Because it's just as you say, for one thing, 
where the duties lie to make accommodations is completely unclear. Um, as you've said, I mean, n technically, as a matter of law, um, your clients aren't allowed to discriminate against you as a barrister, uh, as a barrister on the grounds of your disability or anything else. Your solicitors can't make choices in relation to who to instruct on the basis of disability status any more than gender. But come on, I mean, how, do, how does one know? I mean, you know, you've, uh, your solicitor doesn't brief you, your solicitor doesn't brief you. Um, it's very difficult to know. And in terms of making physical adjustments, is it the courts? Well, yes, they have a duty, but what are you going to do? Ring up on the night before and say, I'd like to speak to the Lord Chief Justice. I can't get into court one. You know, it's, um, uh, and you've been to the courts, so you know what they're, they're like. Um, so it is, it's, you know, there's no doubt it's very difficult. Um, and that's no doubt why we don't have in Matrix, and indeed there are some disabled barristers, um, but very few wheelchair users, for example, very few wheelchair users, um, because it isn't, it's not an environment that um, is, is accommodating of disabled people. Um, and again, that's part of the battle. That battle has to be fought and people have to talk about it and they have to ring up the court and say, I'm not going into that court because I have somebody with me and they're a wheelchair user and we're not coming in unless you make sure there is a court that's available for us. And whatever the, however important the case is, you say, I can't, that's, it's not being heard here. I don't care if it's the Lord Chief Justice's court. He's going to have to sit somewhere else. Um, and that, that has to be done. Thanks, Daniel. This gentleman here, and then you. Yep. Well, I think, um, and I'm not the only person to say this, but I think actually the convention draws the line for us and it draws it in a very nuanced and extremely helpful way. It says you have these rights, which by and large aren't absolute rights. Um, uh, rights that can be intruded upon where there is a greater interest. So through justification, um, as you know, there are, as I'm sure you'll know, there are very few of the rights under the convention are absolute rights. I mean, we've got the absolute right not to be killed by the state, but I think that's fair enough. We've got the absolute right not to be tortured by the state, but I think that's fair enough. Um, but when one comes to things like family life, the right to respect for family life, the state can in interfere with that right if there are good justifiable reasons, if it's, there's a legitimate objective and a legitimate aim and it's proportionate and so on. Um, so yes, there must be a balance and I think in a democratic society we'd all agree there must be a balance and there must be some role for a democratic mandate in that context. We ought to be able to vote for certain things like expenditure and so on and we do. Um, and that's weighed in the balance, but there is a nuanced and pretty effective, I think, w way of balancing those interests um, that I think works so well. Thank you. Yes. You don't look convinced, Francis. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> that, but that you know, Baroness Hale said, "Democracy values everybody, um, uh, 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 even if the law doesn't, uh, or even if yeah." Uh, anyway, yes, you're right. I mean, but but the uh, so so you're saying about the minority voices that aren't h heard in that um, context. Yes, it's true, um, and that's actually. I mean, that but that also is the the reason we must place value on the convention rights mm. because they set a threshold that the court is entitled, indeed bound, to give effect to. So there is a role, yes there's a role for democracy, and there ought to be, um, but there is a floor below which the state can't go, and it's the courts, separate arm of the state, that determines whether or not they've gone below that. 
I mean, I, I, you know, I'm not saying it's a perfect system, but frankly, it's probably pretty close to what we're going to be able to work out as human beings, I would have thought. Yes, slowly in front. Uh, hi, I'm Kim Hi, Golda. Okay. Um, he'd had a stroke a few years back and he was still practicing and I think we all respected him a lot because even more because of the difficulties he went through so it's definitely possible um, secondly my question is about the Human Rights Act do you not think it essentially is a domestic bill of rights by any other name especially as there is already authority for the fact that it's not about enforcing convention rights it creates mirrored domestic rights um, yes, I think we could certainly characterise it as a domestic bill of rights, um, without doubt, and it has a sort of what might be described a quasi-constitutional force in that um, the courts must construe other legislation in uh, favour of it, must grant a declaration of incompatibility and so on. So it has the flavour of a bill of rights. I think what, when we talk about a bill of rights in the way that it's described in the political arena, however, is the idea that it derives entirely from the UK, um, which is one of the difficulties because it is difficult to see what rights deriving from the UK would be very different from those that derive from Europe, unsurprisingly, since we wrote most of them in Europe. The ones that aren't yes. <laughs> like? Well, they'd create ones that wouldn't be so easy to... I see, yes, yes, precisely. But, but yes, in ter I mean, how, how one characterises it, I agree, it's, it's capable of being looked at in, in the terms you describe, yeah. We have time for one more question. We're going to take two more questions, because I'm being generous. So Shane, and then the lady to the other lady. God, that's difficult. I think one of the things that's coming, that's been very, uh, that where the law is very underdeveloped, and I just happen to have had a couple of cases just by chance, is on the equality duty, sorry, on the inequality duties contained within the National Health Service Act. So we now have, very recently introduced by amendments, um, duties imposed on commissioners and the National Health Service executive um, to have regard to the need to reduce health inequalities. And I think there are going to be all sorts of ways, because health is such a broad area, covers, has such a broad reach, we are already trying to think about how do we get protected classes within the broad concept of inequality. So we don't want to restrict it to uh, looking at inequality purely through a health prism, a medical model but looking at social disadvantage and seeing if we can get positive obligations carved out of that. Um, I don't know if that sounds very interesting, but it, it's, it excites people like me. Um, uh, so I think that's one area that we may see. I mean, there are other areas in terms of things like protected classes, asked about who would, you, who would I choose, and I talked about social economic um, disadvantage, but things like travellers, I did a case some years ago where there was a huge fight about whether, whether travellers were an ethnic group, and they were an ethnic group, and that made them, it was decided, um, 
the, the courts decided ultimately after years of fighting that they were an ethnic group. And that made a huge difference to things like planning, uh, discrimination in accessing services and so on. So there are, you know, it takes some time, but my health inequality duty may one day transform the lives of the poor. <laughs> and one last question at the back. Hi, Marina. Mm -hmm. uh, not directly, but I think these things sort of have a very um, they, they creep into people's consciousness without them actually really being conscious of it. Um, I mean, we're seeing that in the context of, for example, the wearing of the veil. Um, there's been some... The, the case law from the European Court of Human Rights is completely split. I mean, we get... You, you must be able to wear religious symbols at work, you mu and then you, you can't... And then, sorry, you can bar them in public, which is bizarre. And then we've got the European Court of Justice advocates general opinion saying yes you can bar, bar them um, and these are pretty I mean innocuous things things like turbans I mean you know that the argument about whether one should be able to wear a turban to work was sorted out 40 years ago um, and so we're getting I mean there really is no difference it seems to me um, in in terms of headwear whether you're wearing a um, uh, you know a, a veil or a um, turban, um, uh, but there is that friction now emerging, and it's obviously emerging because of the way the debate is going about Islam and Muslims. Um, it's feeding that debate, so not consciously, I don't think, um, but I think there are those very worrying things we're seeing developing, which are worrying, and are fed by a right-wing, uh, I think, media and some groundswell of support, which is very worrying. Thank you for the question. Thank you all for the questions. Can we have a round of applause for Karen? You've been marvellous. Thank you. And thank you, Andrea. Um, our thanks to Linklaters, to you all for coming. Um, to Harley, if you don't know him, he's uh, head of our student network. Um, so if you're not a Justice student member, please go and see him. Um, we have lots of things coming up in the pipeline. So if you're a member of the student network, you'll be you'll find out about that in Member of Justice um, and you now have the opportunity to go have a quiet summer drink with Karen and everyone else. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>